love you. Father, we love you because you first loved us. Father, we exalt you, Lord, because even in our sin, Lord, you still love us the same. There is nothing we can do to separate ourselves from your love. And for that, we say thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that even though we, when we don't feel like it, you love us the same, Lord. Even when we don't wanna get out of bed and come to church on Sunday morning, you love us the same, Lord. Even when we don't do right or we don't say the right words, you love us the same, Lord. And for that, we love you and we lift up your name, Lord, because you are great and mighty and worthy, Lord. Regardless of what we do, you deserve the honor and the praise, Lord. And for that, we say thank you on today. We say thank you that your grace and mercy shall follow us all the days of our life. We say thank you that your favor is surrounding us, Lord. We say thank you that you sit high but look low, Lord, and that you're mindful of us, Lord. So we showed up here today to give you honor, to give you glory, to give you praise because of who you are. We exalt your name. We give you praise, Lord. We can't say thank you enough, but we will try. Even if we had 10 tongues, Lord, we would not be able to say thank you enough for how good you are, Lord. On today, we're so thankful that we serve a good, good Father. So we exalt your name on high. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, 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 amen. Take your seats, family, take your seats. I have the honor and privilege of welcoming our guest speaker, who is not a stranger, but a friend of Concord. You may have seen her um, speaking at Fearless Mom or even at the E.K. Bailey Preaching Conference, none other than Tori Dixon. Tori Dixon is here with us today. She is a licensed professional counselor specializing in providing compassionate and graceful guidance for those navigating various aspects of life. Tori completed her undergraduate degree at the University of Oklahoma and later completed, okay, University of Oklahoma, I hear you, I hear you, and her associate's degree in mortuary science at Gupton Jones College of Funeral, Funeral Service and a Master of Science in Mental Health from Walden University with an 18-year career as a licensed mortician as the backdrop. Tori specializes in grief and loss, practicing from the belief that any barrier to mental wellness is ultimately attributed to some sense of loss. Be it the loss of a loved one, the loss of a relationship or marriage, the loss of a job or career, safety or security, after experiencing trauma or loss of confidence in one's ability to thrive. Whatever the loss may be, she believes the grace and space to acknowledge and properly grieve loss is the first step on the road to true healing and emotional and mental wholeness. Concord family, will you give it up for our friend, Miss Tori Dixon. Good morning, Concord family. Boy, it's so good to be here this morning. We thank God. I'm just so honored and so blessed to be with you on this morning. And so I hope everybody brought their prayer cloths with them because I need you to pray with me on this morning. So um, before we get started, I just want to um, give honor to the shepherd of this house in his absence, um, Pastor Brian Carter. Um, come on, you have a wonderful pastor. He's the best on this side of the land. And Lady Carter, we say thank you too as well. Um, I am here this morning with my family, my first pastor, my mommy. She's here. She celebrates a birthday on Tuesday. So if you guys can just wave at her. Thank you, mom, for being here and for my little big brother, my brother Justice. Thank you so much for supporting me. Thank you, Concord, for always opening your doors um, to me on this morning. Um, I have a word from the Lord. And so if you have your Bibles with you, if you would turn with us to Matthew chapter 26, 
And we are going to start at verse, our emphasis verses will be chapter, uh, verses 26 through 36. And we are going to talk about lessons from a grieving Jesus. Let us pray. Father, we thank you right now for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for being the constant and consistent thing in our lives. We thank you for blessing us and keeping us, Father. Thank you for your hedge of protection around us, oh God. Father, as we delve into your word this morning, Father, we thank you that your word will be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. God, we praise you and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So, chapter 20, uh, 26, verses uh, 36 through 46, and it reads, Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, Sit here while I go pray over there. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little further and bowed his face to the ground praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. He said to Peter, couldn't you watch with me for just one hour, 60 seconds, 60 minutes, just one hour. Keep watching praise so that you will not give into temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, my father, if this cup cannot be taken unless, away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping, for they couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went to pray a third time, saying the same things again. Then he came to the disciples and said, go ahead and sleep, have your rest. But look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and the hearing of his word. You may be seated. As already stated, May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And as I was preparing to speak with you on this morning, I've just got a few statistics about mental health and the faith in Christians. And what they found is that nearly 40 million Americans who live and suffer with mental illness, they understand that their faith is helping them pull through, but they are less likely to seek help for it. And so we thought, and I thought it would be really good for us to, just as a reminder that even sometimes when we think that we're the only one in it, we have a Jesus who is right there with us. I want you to take a little trip with me back um, in yesteryear, not too far. It's called the year of 2020. Y'all remember 2020? When we were just caught in the worst human experience of modern times. The reports were out that there was a virus sweeping across the land, and though that virus seemed to mimic the common flu, this one was new. Not only was it taking our breath away, but it was killing us three to four times more than the average flu. So by mid-March, we were officially in a global pandemic, and the culprit we would come to know as COVID. I'm sure you can recall the sheer panic that swept across the world as we began shutting down and shutting in. With thousands of people dying all over the country and protesters marching, as a nation, we were either trying to catch our breath in the streets or we were in hospitals trying to catch our breath on a ventilator. In this moment, I need you to take a deep breath in through your nose and slowly out through your mouth. For many of us, that's the first breath you took all week. 
I want you to take a minute to remember exactly where you were the moment when your whole life came to a stop. Everything planned had been plundered by the plow of a pandemic, and we were collectively in a state of shock, and we all were in a state of grief. Grief is the response to loss that contains thoughts, behaviors, emotions, and psychological changes. If the loss is permanent, so too is the grief. But its form evolves and changes as a person adapts to the loss. And what we've learned during the pandemic and since is that every loss we experience is going to come with grief. The problem with loss is that not every loss is marked with a grave marker. Some of those losses can still look like maybe financial loss due to bankruptcy or maybe the destruction of property or maybe a diminishment of your physical and mental capacities, a disillusion of a dream or life ambition. Maybe you lost a relationship due to divorce or an ending friendship or maybe you lost a job or career or Maybe you lost your safety after you experienced some sense of trauma. Or maybe you lost your singlehood due to marriage. And, or maybe you, lost, and you found a loss in retirement, right? Or maybe you have a loss with an unmet expectation. But any time you lose anything, you are going to grieve. And it's quiet as it's kept. You all are sitting here right with me in your Sunday's best, and most of you are grieving. The problem with grief is that grief is not a one-size-fit-all type thing. As, many, as much as we grieve so many different things, different grief come in different sizes. Many of us are doing a grief that you probably won't find in any of your studies because I made it up. It's called unbeknownst to me. You know when you grieve and you have no idea that you're actually grieving, but you're saying things like, everything is getting on my nerves. I feel so, as my grandmother would say, unnecessary. I don't know exactly what that is, but she said, I feel so unnecessary. And what about that thing you said, man, I just can't put my finger on it. What about everything is rubbing you the wrong way? That's that grief that's unbeknownst to you and me. I have a few other types of grief that I would like to share with you. There is abbreviated grief. Abbreviated grief, it's actually short-lived. And the loss is minor, so there is no strong attachment to the loss, so you grieve abbreviated. An example would be, let's say if you lost an earring, or maybe you lost a cufflink, or perhaps you lost an old beat-up car in an accident. Although you did not expect that loss to occur, that is an abbreviated grief. Then oftentimes we have acute grief. And acute grief occurs in the early period after a loss, and it often dominates the life of a bereaved person. Strong feelings of yearning and longing and sorrow are typical as it insists that the thoughts and the memories of the person or the thing that you lost. It comes along with it some very painful emotions, including anxiety and anger and remorse and guilt or shame. And these are all common, but it is acute because it happens right after the loss. But what happens when the loss was 20 years ago? Then that grief becomes what we call complicated. It just gets complicated. That grief persists in the form of intense grief, which is maladaptive thoughts and dysfunctional behaviors. It comes along with yearning, longing, and sadness. The last of this that I would like to share with you is what we call anticipatory grief. You know that grief that you have when you have this feeling in your stomach that the shoe is just about to drop. The next one is coming and you don't know what it is, but I'm grieving in the process. It's that you are anticipating a loss and so you pre-rehearse your grief. When we go to our, our text in Matthew chapter 26, it actually drops us right in a story where we find our Jesus in the throes of anticipatory grief. As he is awaiting his impending betrayal, 
and he is uh, a tr on trumped up charges and his brutal death. At the beginning of the chapter 26, we find him explaining to his disciples that his hour of death has come. His accusers are on the other side of town planning his demise. And meanwhile, Jesus is at the house of Simon the leper having a meal. He wasn't even panicked, even though he knew that they were planning and plotting against him. You see, Jesus was sitting there and a woman walks in with a beautiful box that she breaks open and pours out her oil on him. And when the disciples became angry at her breaking of this box for this amazing oil, Jesus said, wait a minute, she's preparing my body for death. He was anticipating what he knew was going to happen, but it just hadn't happened yet. Then we find Jesus moving over to a meal called Passover with the 12. And if you know anything about the story, he sits there and he says, listen, somebody in here is about to turn on me. The feds are sitting at the table. I am feeding the feds. They're coming for me. And Jesus says, somebody in here is responsible. And so everybody starts to ask the question, is it me? And so Jesus looks at his, then Jesus looks at his closest friends. So now Jesus is not only sitting in front of a broken box and now he has to break his body for his meal. He also now has to deal with the thought of this broken friendship. Jesus talks about the fact that one of these people and Judas knew who he was, as did Jesus. He says, listen, you're going to come after me. You are the mole. Then Jesus looked to his closest friend, Peter. And he sees in his eyes that Peter is just about to break his promise. He said, nah, Jesus, it won't be me. I got you. I'm your dude. He's like, nah. And three times, you're going to get me. You're going to be the one that say, you never knew me. So this brings me to my first point. That Jesus is deeply acquainted with grief that has been associated with brokenness. So if you've ever had your heart broken, if your life has been broken, I want you to know that you're actually in good company. Jesus understands how much it costs to be broken. He understands how much it takes for you to show up in life with pieces and no peace. He knows what it takes for you to grieve and still have to go. And because he knows how much it takes for you to be you in the midst of your crisis, he sends us the Holy Spirit that leads, guides, and keeps us. So if you find yourself in a season where it feels like you're just waiting for the other shoe to drop, I'm here to bring you a bit of good news. That shoe that you're waiting for to drop is in the hands of a God who's never failed and has never dropped anything. You need to know that your brokenness does not exempt you from the blessings of God. Jesus starts his conversation with the disciples by describing himself as the son of man. You might, you might wonder why would he say not the son of man and that I am God or I am Jesus. He wanted to prepare them for an experience that they would watch him go through that they had never seen before. See, the disciples understood who Jesus was when he was the water walking Jesus. They understood who he was when he was the wine making Jesus. They even understood who he was when he was the lame healing Jesus. But this experience would be the epitome of Jesus being fully human. His human experience means that he voluntarily emptied himself of his deity so that he can be just like you and me. Now, if we're going to learn anything about this grieving Jesus, I'm going to have to ask you to remember Philippians 2, verses, chapter 2, verses 6 through 7. And it reminds us that though he was God, he did, not think of, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divinity, divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. So you have to understand that Jesus was a human being who experienced every array of mental and emotional condition that you and I would face. 
If we don't see him as having dropped his deity, we would think that somehow he was able to jump, skip, and maybe meander his way through an emotional crisis. But this time he says, no, I'm going to go through it so that you too can know that I am with you. Jesus, which brings me to my second point, that Jesus was honest about his emotional experience in his grieving. From the Garden of Eden to now the Garden of Gethsemane, God has always been concerned about our mental and emotional wellness. Don't get it twisted. He's just not concerned about how well your spirit is, but he says, I want you to prosper as your soul prospers. In other words, I really can't understand how well your soul is prospering if your body and your mind is deteriorating. So the first time in the Garden of Eden, the first thing that God decided to address with humanity was its loneliness. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, God said, listen, this is the first time we hear the creator say that something ain't good. And that's because he looked at a man who he knew that if he didn't take time enough to address his emotional need, it would call an external catastrophic event. Excuse me. So if God deemed it necessary to address emotional distress in Eden, and in our text, we find that Jesus is deeming it necessary to address his emotional distress in Gethsemane, then you too must deem it necessary to address your emotional distress here in Oak Cliff. It's impossible to grieve about what you won't be honest about losing. You can't properly grieve a pain that you intend to take to the grave. And while everything confronted cannot be changed, nothing can be changed that is not confronted. So when Jesus' grief moves from this point of anticipatory grieving to complicated grief, he was candid with his circle about where he was. Take a look at Matthew 26, verse 38. He said, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. In verse 39, he said, I'm drinking of the cup of suffering. Go down to verse 42, and he begged in anguish, God, please take this cup away from me. The lesson of his honesty is that we must come out of shame and guilt and be honest too. Hiding behind spiritual euphemisms won't help you with the grieving process. Yes, we know the Lord will make a way. Yes, we know by and by he's going to come and see about us. But right here and the right now, you have to take care of what is taking care of you. You can either handle your grief or your grief will handle you. Either way, something will be handled. So even in his honesty, in his pain, in his hurt, he was also honest about what he needed. He asked them three times, stay here and keep watch. And so while you are in your grieving period, you may not know exactly what you need in the moment, but just open in your mouth and say, somebody keep watch. Watch my back. I can't see what's going on around me because my grief is shrouded over me. I need for you to watch me. I don't need for you to take advantage of me. I need you to hold me up. I need you to look around and if you see danger, I need you to bring it to my attention because grief has a way and sorrow has a way of blinding you to where you are in your current season. Jesus, while grieving in the middle of, his, of this crisis of epic proportion, and the thing we know about a crisis is that it never comes at a convenient time. What I've come to find out is that crisis is disrespectful. It has no manners. It doesn't call before it comes over. It doesn't text to see if you're busy, nor does it ask who all is going to be over there. It just shows up. A crisis doesn't care if you're already in a crisis or if you're in a beautiful garden. It's just going to pull up on you. And so when you're grieving in the middle of a crisis, your defenses are down and you can lose your sense of direction, which leads me to my third point. Jesus sought counsel to gain wisdom necessary to manage his emotions experienced during his grieving process. 
And so as I read the text, it didn't surprise me that the wonderful counselor would himself seek counsel to ensure that he was able to deal with the complexities of his grief. The scripture states that three times Jesus went to his father to lament his condition while asking for his help. Let this be a reminder to you that you too can ask for help. So if you are here under the sound of my voice, I want you to scream out the word help. help. Say, God, I need your help. So sometimes we don't know where that help is going to come from. It may come from a therapist. It may come from a billboard, something that you watch on TV, but help is available to you. Many of us are suffering in silence because the fear of what they. You know what the what they fear is, right? What they going to say and what they going to think. But Jesus did not care what they said or what they thought. He reached out for help when he knew that he was facing a moment that he had never experienced before in his life. But when he prayed to his father and he asked him to give him peace, in verse 50 he said, my friends, you go ahead and sleep on because now I have something that's going to be greater than even your help. When Jesus stopped, he said, God's wisdom is what I got through his will. When we ask God for strength, he exchanges it for our weakness. And God gives us peace for our broken pieces. And so sometimes, oftentimes, when, when folks ask me, well, Tori, is therapy biblical, right? Because the saints need a scripture. My mama always told me, everywhere you go, carry the Lord and a scripture along with you. So Proverbs 11, 14, and 15 says, where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. If you go to Proverbs 15 and 22, it says, without counsel, plans fail. But with many advisors, they succeed. Proverbs 19 and 20, it says, listen to advice and accept instructions that you may gain wisdom in the future. Proverbs 26, 24 and 6 says, by, for by wisdom guidance, you can wage your war and in an abundance of counselors, there is victory. So I want to encourage you as you sit here all saved, sanctified, Holy Ghost filled, five baptized, got Jesus on your side and running for your life. May you find counsel in people who can help you through your grief. You are not alone. Jesus is with you and he is sending people along your path to be able to help you navigate what needs to happen in life. I know you may think that your life is the only life that's destructive, but the Bible is full of characters who have a lot of issues. Noah was a drunk. Elijah has suicidal thoughts and ideations. David was probably bipolar in some sense, and all of them were anointed by the hand of God to take care of the mission that he has called them in commission. So you are not alone. No matter what it looks like, no matter what it feels like, you are not alone. There is counsel for you. If your heart is grieving today, let me first say, I am sorry for your loss. Sometimes healing a loss just means that somebody acknowledges that the loss even happened. So may you find comfort in knowing that there are people here who see you, who know you, who are praying for you, and who want the absolute best for you. No matter where you are in your life, you may be in the garden of your life. Everything may be flourishing and going well. Or you may be on the other side where things are complicated and difficult. But I want you to know that there is a Savior that though he grieves with you, he does not leave you. Jesus is our ultimate sacrifice who came and died so that we may have our right to live eternally. So whether you're grieving or you're growing, may you know that the peace of God is always with you and he will sustain you no matter what your season. Let us pray. Father, I thank you today for your word. I thank you, Father God, that there is nothing that is too big or too great for you. Father, I thank you that even in your own humanity, you showed us 
that grief is not beyond you, Father, and that you see us and that you know us and that you care for us, oh God. God, I thank you for coming alongside us, for walking alongside us, Father God, through every difficult season of our lives. Father, I thank you that whatever has been lost in whatever way, that you will step in and be the great God that you are, that you will fill the spaces, that you will fill the void. We thank you for your word. We thank you that it does not return into you void, but it accomplishes that which you've set it out to do. We give you all the praise and all the glory and the honor. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen.